Good morning and welcome. If you have your Bible handy in uh, printed form or digital form, I encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Uh, we're going to look there in this message. No more condemnation. We have the life of Jesus Christ within us as Christians. He saved us by taking our sin upon himself. There is no more condemnation because we have been forgiven. We are free from any further condemnation and yet many believers have a difficult time with this truth, condemning themselves. The reason, reasoning kind of goes like this. Jesus died for my sins, so I'm forgiven for the sins I have committed. But what if I sin tomorrow? Romans chapter 6, verse 10, the apostle says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And then in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The Old Testament system of sacrifice could not get the job done. When Jesus died once for all sins, how many of our sins were then in the future? Well, they all were. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took our sin on himself and he became sin for us in order that by his death on the cross and our forgiveness, we would become the righteousness of God in him because of what he did. Why no more condemnation? Well, we are in Christ. The cross of Calvary is it's critical. As sinners, we deserved condemnation for our, in our former state. But God offered a pardon in Jesus Christ by his finished work on the cross. We've been pardoned and we're free from the law of sin and death. We can love God by the help of the Holy Spirit. Those in Christ can live the new life in him. Will believers still sin? Well, of course. First John chapter 2, verse 1. My, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, what does all this mean for the Christian? Well, in the context of no condemnation, our text for this message presents three results of being in Christ. Three results. Well, let's look at our text. 
If you haven't turned there already, turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to look at those uh, first 10, 11 verses. And then let's look at those three results of being in Christ. That having no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law, on a, excuse me, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So, three results as we talk about no condemnation, no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. Three results of being in Christ from this text. First of all, believers do not have to fear God's condemnation. Look at it again at that first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is now no condemnation. We've escaped judgment for sin and punishment in hell. We now have eternal life and heaven as our hope. And we can never lose it. And why is that? Salvation is the work of God and not of man. You are pardoned if, if, well look at verse 9 to consider if. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he's not his. We're pardoned because of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit has come to live within us as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. I remember a pastor his name was Tom Skinner. I remember him giving an illustration one day of crucifying yourself. You know, you take the nails, you take the hammer. Well, okay, you get it, grab a nail, you nail one into the feet. You grab another one, nail it into that hand. Now what are you going to do? You see, you can't crucify yourself. 
And because we're pardoned, because Jesus Christ died for us and we are now in Christ because of our faith in him and what he did on the cross, we need to stop condemning ourselves. Stop condemning yourself. You are pardoned in Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, oh, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but l perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us and sent Jesus Christ to the cross that we might be forgiven. So those in Christ do not have to fear God's wrath on sin. No more condemnation. If you're in Christ, those in Christ don't have to fear God's wrath on sin. Second, believers do not have to allow sin to reign. We don't have to allow sin to reign in our lives. Look at verse 2 again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Has made me free. Verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You do not have to sin. But how do you avoid the temptation to sin? The key is in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. If you turn there. Romans chapter 6, in verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reckon yourself. Consider yourself. Determine. Make that determination in your heart and mind. You are dead to sin, but you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. The Lord. 1 Corinthians. This is the key. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We always look at it, these verses 31 and 32, as part of the formula for sharing in the Lord's Supper and being right when we do that. Being worthy. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. You see, so a key in being dead to sin is examining ourselves, judging ourselves to see what's going on. Is there some area of our life that needs some work? Is there some sin pattern that's beginning to take a root that we need to deal with so that we will remain dead to sin? Hebrews chapter 12, God, you see, God is about getting us right before him. A Holy Spirit's work is for us to become more and more like Christ, to become uh, more and more as God would have us to be. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we have 
had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Reckon yourself dead to sin. Always examining yourself. Always considering if there's some temptation that's brought in sin that you need to deal with. The area of your, listen, the area of your life where you feel the strongest is a potential weakness and target for temptation. Well, what am I talking about? You see, we, we think about, well, I'm strong in this area or I'm strong in that area. The weak areas, I need to pray about those weak areas. Well, the problem with the strong areas, the areas that we feel pretty good about, those areas can become weak and become uh, targets of temptation because we don't consider it a problem. And so we don't give it much, much attention. I always remember the story of a former, the former president of Inter InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Gordon MacDonald. He fell into adultery and it ended his ministry. The thing was, he believed that he was solid in the area of sexual sin. But he ended up falling into adultery, which ended his ministry. He always thought, well, maybe, maybe other areas, but temptation is not an issue in this one. Sexual sin is not an issue. Well, you see, we feel strong, we feel confident that we've got that area under control so we don't give it the attention that we should. We don't examine it that, that much. We're not cautious in that area and it becomes a weakness and an, a temptation target for the enemy. Those in Christ don't have to allow sin to rule in them. We need to be examining ourselves. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin. You see, a dead person isn't tempted by anything. He's dead. Well, we need to be dead to sin. So those in Christ do not have to allow sin to rule in them. And then third, believers do not have to walk in the flesh. Again, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Do not walk according to the flesh. You know, it's kind of like the, the danger in the old days of cannons on a, on, a, uh, on a ship. If one of the cannons got loose, I think it would roll around with the movement of the ship. And boy, that loose cannon could do a lot of damage to the ship. Well, in the same way, walking in the flesh can make a mess of your life and your ministry in Christ. Discerning your walk. How, how do you know if you're in the spirit or in the flesh? How do you know? 
whether you're walking in the, by the Spirit or whether you're walking in the flesh. How do you know? Well, actually, you know it's pretty easy. If you turn to Galatians chapter 5, which talks about the Spirit and the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, around verse 16. Let's look at those first couple of verses. We need to, we need to discern our walk. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts, lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So, if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Well, we just need to see what's going on in our lives. We spoke in the last point about examining ourselves, about reckoning ourselves dead to sin, examining ourselves. Well, as we examine ourselves, we can see what's going on. Are we walking in the flesh or are we walking in the spirit? Well, it's all here. Verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Okay, here we go. You can see them. These are the works of the flesh. If these things are going on in your life, you're walking in the, in the flesh. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. The difference between adultery and fornication is Adultery is when two people are having sex and one of them is married, or both of them is married, but not to each other. Having sex with someone you're not married to, who one of you is married. That's adultery. Fornication is two people not married having sex. So the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, just in case you missed something there. All these things and anything else that's like that. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things do not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who have these patterns ongoing in their lives are probably not believers. Are we walking in the flesh? Now as believers, we can step into the flesh. We have those patterns in our lives ongoing. There's a good chance we're not Christians. But we can step into the flesh. We can be tempted to sin and step into the flesh. Holy Spirit convicts us. We repent, seek forgiveness, and get back walking in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, so that's the works of the flesh are evident, but also the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, so if you, those things you're walking in the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So if the fruit of the Spirit is bearing, then walking in the Spirit. Holy Spirit's in control. We're walking 
if the, if the works of the flesh are evident, then we've stepped out of the spirit and we're walking in the flesh. And then look at verse 24. Here's, here's the key. Here's the key. We're talking about being reckoning ourselves dead to sin. Those who are Christ's, verse 24, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Here's the argument. We live in the spirit because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has come to live within us. And so we are in Christ and we are in the spirit. And because of that, we should be walking in the spirit. If we're not walking in the spirit and instead are walking in the flesh, we need to repent, seek forgiveness, and get back recommitted to walking in the spirit. Well, let me ask you a question here today. Or how are you walking as a Christian? How are you walking? I mean, what is it that's radiating from your life for others to see? Are they seeing the works of the flesh? Or are they experiencing the fruit of the Spirit? You're the one that needs to, as you seek to reckon yourself dead to sin, need to examine yourselves. Listen, we must assume responsibility for our attitudes and our actions. Those who are in Christ no longer need to fear condemnation. And those who though and those in Christ can live a victorious Christian life. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the truth that as we have acknowledged our need, our sin, and we have asked Jesus to forgive us because of what he did on the cross, taking our sin onto himself that we might be able to receive by faith his righteousness. And because of that, there is no more condemnation. We are no longer under the law of sin and death. But we have forgiveness, we have freedom, we have the hope of eternal life. And Father, I pray that everyone listening to or watching this message would receive this truth. To be able to walk without the fear of condemnation and living victorious Christian life. Father, thank you, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray.